Hello, everybody. Welcome to CERN. Welcome to the CMS experiment, 100 meters down below ground, where we're going live right now for you. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, we talk about the pixel detector. We talk about uh, analyzing the data from a pixel detector. We're going to have two special guests. And uh, so please uh, share the live. Uh, ask your questions in the comments. We're going to be replying to your questions. Uh, CMS detector is a particle detector. Particle detectors are often compared to digital cameras that take images of particle collisions that we can then analyze and see what's going on. Now, actually, when protons collide, uh, they collide 40 million times per second. But when they collide, it's not two protons that collide, but it's of the order of 40 protons that collide at the same time. So the picture that we have is not a picture of one collision, but it's a picture of many collisions superimposed. So it's kind of like, imagine taking a photo of somebody's face and then taking 40 photos of different people, just putting them all together and trying to identify what person is on the photograph. That's kind of the problem we have here. And we're going to be also talking about the, the pixel detector, which is the part of CMS closest to the, to the, to the interaction region, to the, to the place where the protons collide. And it's the part of, the, of CMS that, most, that, is, that bears the closest resemblance to an actual photographic camera. Now, my, to, to meet with my first guest, I have to go a little bit back in time and a little bit uh, back in space. I'll go back to, to, to a place right in the center of CMS, and I'll go back to last Friday, where I met with Lelea Caminada to talk about uh, the insertion of the, of the barrel pixel. So let's, let's see that first. OK, I'm here with uh, Lea Caminada, the project leader of the barrel pixel detector. So Lea, please tell us, what is the pixel detector? The pixel detector is the innermost part of the CMS detector, and it sits closest to the interaction point. And it's actually right here behind us. So it consists of a barrel part, which is made from cylindrical layers, so four cylindrical layers. And this is what we call the barrel pixel detector. And then it has also cap disks on both sides, which is what we call the forward pixel detector or FPIX. Mm -hmm. So you're going to meet our colleagues from FPIX next week. Yeah, when I'm back to present time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So the barrel pixel detector is made of the cylindrical layers. And on the cylindrical layers, we have these sort of pixel detector modules. Uh, one of these modules consists of 66,000 pixels with a size of 100 times 150 microns. So there's, so there's 66,000 pixels on in, one module. In one of these. <laughs> and the whole detector consists of almost 2,000 modules. So there's 2,000 modules like this in four layers surrounding the place where the particles collide. Right, exactly. Fantastic. So how many pixels is there in total then? In total, there are 124 million pixels. So 124 megapixel, you would call it, if you wanted to sell it uh, Exactly. As but a the camera. fascinating part about the pixel detector is not so much the amount of pixel, but the fact that it takes a picture 40 million times per second. So every time that the collision happens, it records the particles that go out of this collision. So it's a 124 megapixel camera that takes 40 million images per For second. Exactly, 40 million frames per second. Per second. That, that, that is incredible. So, so this camera uh, was just inserted earlier this week into the center of CMS. Yes, and right. It was, it, it's been actually taken out, and now it made its way back in. So how, how was the operation uh, performed? Could exactly. you just walk so, us through the operation? So we took it out at the end of run two, and then we did refurbishment work at the surface in, the, in a clean room. And now on Monday, we uh, took out the pixel detector from the, from the clean room, and then we use the big crane here to lower the pixel detector through the shaft to the 100 meter underground cavern of CMS. Once it arrived here, we put it on the floor of the cavern. And then with a smaller crane, we lifted the pixel detector to the platform and, 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 and placed it close to the beam pipe. And now the, the, the whole detector um, is placed in a, in, a, in a box, basically, which we call a cassette. 
and we then discuss it that there are there are rail there is a rail system, and then we use um, short extension rails to connect the rails of the cassette to the rails which are here behind us mm -hmm. in the center of CMS. Now the, the, the detector that we installed, so the part that we installed is not just the, 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 the barrel pixel detector, which is about half a meter in size, but it also has the whole readout electronics and power and cooling system and so on. So the whole uh, system is almost five meter in length. Okay. And then basically we, we rolled out the detector of its box and gently inserted it into the center of CMS. So you just basically pushed it in? Exactly, we pushed it in, but we did this very carefully because there is very uh, little clearance between the innermost layer, cylindrical layer of the detector and the beam pipe. So we have to be very careful when we insert it that we don't hit the beam pipe. And luckily everything went well. Ah. So we installed Fantastic. both sides very smoothly and then <clears throat> We, we place them um, here. So what you can see here, these cables, this is actually the end of the part that we installed. So okay. after the installation, we still had to, 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 to make this connection to connect the pixel detector to the outside world. Mm -hmm. But when we installed the detector, this was not yet it, because in order to be able to install it, we sort of have to insert it in an open position so that we have more clearance to the beam pipe. And then when it reached its final position, we used very long screwdrivers to, just, to close it. Yeah. Exactly, such that it then really makes a, a very nice cylinder around the interaction point. And, and we, are, we have a, a sensitive layers all around. So we, we constructed it in such a way, such that we can actually install the detector when the beam pipe is already in place. So we can insert and take out the detector without really interrupting the, yeah. the, the operation of, I see. of CMS. I see. Okay, so, so now, now that the, the detector is in, the barrel pixel detector is, is in, the, the forward pixel detector is going to go in, in in a few days. Yes, right. Uh, and then we're, we're going to have the tracker up and operational, uh, ready, ready, ready to start taking data. So, so let's talk about the, the whole tracker for, for a moment, because the, the tracker in CMS is used to, to reconstruct trajectories of particles. Yeah, right? correct. That, that, that's, that's sort of the, the, the main pur I mean, that, that's the, the, the purpose of the tracker, to reconstruct trajectories. But how does it do that in reality? Okay. So, so if you have the, 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 the collisions which happen in the center of the CMS detector, then the, the, the particles that the tracker can measure are charged particles. And so they, they originate in the collision and then fly outwards through the tracker layers. And as we said, the tracker is made from individual sensitive layers. Mm -hmm. So you have the particle and then it flies outward, it hits the first layer and there basically with the, detract, with, with the detector we can measure precisely where this happened and so we can reconstruct let's say a point in three-dimensional space where we have seen these charged particles. Okay, so when, when it hits the layer it's actually we know exactly which part of the layer it hit. So we don't, we don't know that it went somewhere, somewhere here but we know it went through this exact point in space. Exactly, and we know that with very uh, with great precision. Mm -hmm. And so now from there, it basically, it goes to the next layer. The same thing happened again. You have a point on the next layer yeah. and so on. So it goes through all the layers of the pixel detector, through all the layers of the tracker detector. And how many are there in total? Uh, I think there are about 16 layers so of the, <laughs> it, of it, the it, dep detector. it depends where you go, right? It, it changes. Yes, exactly. Uh, exactly. So it depends on whether you go in the forward region or in the barrel region. But, but roughly speaking, it's that but number. It's, it's that order of magnitude, right? It's, yes, it's about exactly. 15 or 16 layers. Exactly. So at the end of the day, when, when the particle goes through the tracker, you end up with 15, let's say 15 points Exactly. In space. And then you have to run a reconstruction algorithm to connect these, these points to give you a, a, the, the measurement of the trajectory. Okay. So, so, the, so basically, you, you just take these points and you just connect them to, to form a line. And that exactly. line, what do you learn from the line? You, you learn that the particle was there. Exactly, but you can learn more thing because the tracker detector is placed in a magnetic field of 3.8 Tesla and the charged particles bend in this magnetic field. Mm -hmm. And then from the curvature of the track, you can deduce the momentum of the particle, but also whether it was a positively or negatively charged particle. 
And then you can do even more. So you can basically um, follow the line back and extrapolate where the particle came from. And that is where the pixel detector really helps you. So thanks to the pixel detector, you can measure with about 10 micron precision where the particle originated from. Fantastic. So now you know. Now you know how a tracker works. Thanks very much, Leia, for this. And Thank we you, go Piotr. back to present, present time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right, and we're back. And I'm, John, I'm joined with, uh, by John Conway, the leader of the team that has put in the forward pixel detector basically yesterday and today, right? That's right. We spent a lot of time on the uh, platform that you see behind me uh, with a crew of about 10 people. Okay. And uh, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about the pixel detector in general. So what is specifically the role of the pixel detector in, in an experiment like CMS? Well, like you said, we have protons colliding 40 million times a second, and when they collide, it's not just you know two protons colliding, but uh, about 30 or 40 pairs of protons annihilating each other, and tons and tons of tracks come out, and the pixel detector is able to very, very precisely tell you where each particle that emerges from these collisions came from. And that's super important in analyzing the data that we're trying to collect here. So, so how does that help us with, the, with, these, uh, with these 40 collisions per second? Uh, so typically, when protons collide, we're usually not interested in what came out. But every so often, there's a very interesting collision. And we want to get that. We want to know where along the beam line those two protons collided. And the pixel detector can tell us where that happened to within a fraction of a human hair in, in width, in, in, you know, in precision. Yeah, let's, let's maybe see an image of, of that. Uh, so, so when uh, the protons are colliding, this image shows what we see, as we say, 40 million times a second. Every 25 billionths of a second, that happens. And the pixel detector is able to capture where each one of those particles that you saw in the picture passed through each of the pixel uh, detector planes. And from that, we you know, connect the dots and track it back to where the proton collision that we're interested in happened. Knowing that, we can sort of ignore the rest of the stuff. So it's a signal to noise sort of issue. So, so, so this is what allows us to sort of pick the, the one collision from, from, from the many by just finding where physically in space the, the, the tracks meet. Exactly. Right? And, and the pixel gives us the precision that, that we need Right, it's the most precise uh, charged particle tracking detector we have in the experiment. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. How, how big is that uh, sort of region where the collisions happen? So it is spread out over a region about this big, about uh, 15 centimeters long. Okay. And, and they're, you know, sort of grouped in the middle. But okay. Uh, so the pixel detector, the, the operation that we had going this week and the, the week before, was the insertion of the pixel tracker in CMS. So it had to be inserted, but first, of course, it had to come out. Right. But wh why did we take it out in the first place? Well, we took it out in January of 2019 because we knew that the Large Hadron Collider was going to have a long shutdown of over two years. And the Large Hadron Collider underwent um, upgrades and maintenance and repairs, but so did the experiment uh, that you see behind me. So the pixel detector came out and we took it to the surface and kept it very cold uh, for a long time to prevent further radiation damage and also to do some repairs on the electronics that um, you know, you know, needed, needed changing out. There were mm -hmm. some improvements that we made in some of the components. But the most important reason was that the central part, the innermost layer closest to the collisions, got damaged by radiation and needed to be replaced. Okay. So if but the, the replacement is different from the original? Or? No, it's just a one-on-one, one-for-one replacement. Rebuilt the inner layer and put it I in see. in the last two years. Yeah. I see. Okay, uh, so let's see if, if we have any, uh, any questions coming in uh, on, on the social media that, that we could uh, answer. Uh, so there's one already uh, from Ariane Par Parwell. How much data does it output every second? So how much data does the pixel? That's a really good question. If we just let all of the data come out of this thing and, and didn't sort of stop it, <laughs> yeah. then uh, we would be totally overwhelmed. Our data acquisition system couldn't handle the flood of data coming out. 
but so the the electronics in the pixel detector itself can say yes or no i have a hit and yes this hit uh corresponds to an interesting event that we want to that we want to keep mm -hmm. so eventually we have you know terabytes per day recorded but if we try to record all the information coming out it would be just unbelievable we couldn't do it so okay. we have this system to uh reduce the reduce amount of information yeah. that we need to collect right okay uh do we have anything else? oh yeah we have uh Ah, okay. So there's there's a question. So that must be quick. That was quick. That, so there's a question that actually re references what you just said. So Harshi Kirshma Morthy. Okay, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, ask. So what are the cr criteria for selecting these events? Well, um, one of the things we're interested in is when these protons collide. We want to see the cases where they just completely annihilate each other, and we have a, an enormous amount of energy coming out. Okay. So that's one thing. But also, there are sort of very rare processes that give us particles that we call leptons. And uh, leptons are interesting because they tell us that the interaction that occurred uh, is something that we call the weak interaction as opposed to the strong interaction. We could get into that, but it's a complicated <laughs> thing. Yeah. But we're, we're interested in very rare processes. So, so basically, depending on the type of particle that emerges... Right. We, we can identify all sorts of different particles, including photons, very high energy gamma rays, mm -hmm. uh, electrons, and their counterpart, anti-electrons, particles called muons, which uh, go all the way to the outside of our detector. In fact, the name of the detector is CMS, Compact Muon Solenoid. Muons yeah, is our middle name. It comes <laughs> from muon. <laughs> okay, let's see if there's any more questions uh, uh, coming in already. There is one in a, a different color uh, scheme. So you go cubing. So there's four layers for detecting particles that may have quantum tunneled past the first couple of pixel layers. OK, so, <laughs> so the, 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 the particles, these particles tunnel past uh, the pixel. don't need to rely on uh, quantum tunneling to get through all the layers of our detector. They have such high energy that they just go flying through the silicon that the pixel detector is made of. And some of them make it all the way to the outer part of this enormous detector that you see behind me, the, the muons in particular. Yeah, so, so the detector looks, uh, looks pretty solid, but for the, for the particles, depending on the type of particle, it's, it's actually pretty transparent, especially, especially the tracker. Well, right? the, whole, the whole idea of this sort of concentric arrangement of the different particles from inside out is, in fact, that some particles stop in material and other particles pass through it. And we can use how far they get in our detector as uh, an, in an indication of what kind of particle it is that we're seeing. So it helps us with particle exactly. identification. Yeah. But having charged particle tracking gives us a very precise information on where it came from and what its uh, momentum is, how much energy it has mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. OK, so uh, remember, you, you, of course, please keep asking the questions. Remember to share the, the, this live broadcast to all your friends so, so they, can, they can join in. Now, there's another thing about the tracker, which is the temperature, right? right. The parts of CMS are kept, uh, are kept warm. Right. The, the, the magnet, that's also in the name of CMS, because compact muon solenoid, and S in CMS stands for the solenoidal magnet, that's kept at 4 Kelvin, right. an insanely cold temperature. Yeah. Now, what, what, how, how's the tracker? What, what temperature do we keep the, the, so the, 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 the tracker at? We operate the tracker at minus 20 degrees centigrade. Minus 20. Yeah, this, this keeps the noise down, uh, and it also... Uh, allows us to efficiently remove the heat from the detector. We actually use liquid CO2 flowing through the detector. Carbon dioxide. Planes. Liquid carbon dioxide, yeah. right. You didn't think there is liquid carbon dioxide, right? Because, you know, dry ice just goes straight to... Yeah, you're right. Right, but at very high pressures, and the pressures inside the cooling system are uh, tens of atmospheres, mm -hmm then you, there is a liquid phase to, to carbon dioxide, and we exploit that, yeah. Yeah, because, so, because minus 20, that's above the temperature of dry ice, right? right dry ice is right. like minus 80-ish or something. Exactly. So, so if, you, if you take it at minus 20 and just squeeze it hard, right. it becomes liquid. Exactly. Okay, and so it's actually boiling carbon dioxide going through the... Mm -hmm. uh, but it's at minus 20 degrees yeah. centigrade. Now, when we take the detector out, we want to keep it as cold as possible because... Uh, the radiation damage can get worse if you allow it to be warm 
while you're not operating it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's see if there's any more questions coming in. And there is. 5.075, Newton Ripewit. How long does it take to process the data and get results? Huh, that's a good question. It's a very good <laughs> question. Uh, it, it, it takes, once we're done, let's say we start our run of, uh, you know, which will last many months, okay? We try to keep up with the data coming out during the next, so during the next year when the beams come back on again and we're producing tons of data, we'll try to analyze it and keep it up. But that takes millions of processing cores working full time to do that. So by the, and, and then there's calibration to be done, all sorts of uh, simulation of the events that are happening. That takes even more computing uh, to really do an analysis, for example, of the data that will collect in this year through 2024, probably, probably there will still be papers coming out with analysis in 2028 or something like that. So it's really many, many years. It takes years. That, that, yeah. that, that, that you need to, to, to process the data and, and finally put yeah, out a the result. The first level processing happens almost, you know, almost keeping up with the data coming out. Mm -hmm. After we stop taking data, well, it'll be a few months and then we'll be caught up. Yeah. Okay, uh, so let's let's maybe coming back for a second to the to the pixel uh, to the pixel tracker. Uh, how many people are are necessary to to, to sort of uh, construct and operate right. su su such a such a device? Well, the whole experiment has over three thousand physicists uh, involved, and of them, about six hundred are involved in the the charge particle tracking, the inner detector. The pixel detector itself is part of that and has around 100 people active. 100 at, at people. A, yeah. yeah. To, bu to build it, to operate it, to analyze the data from it, so forth. To take it out and put it in. Take, a, take it out and put it in. Yeah. All right, let's see if, if, we, have, if we have more questions. Uh, Blair Frank Daniels. Can you make a detector using the new superconducting technology? Um, I'm not sure which new yeah. superconducting technology. Well, maybe warm temperature. We, we would love, we would love to have high temperature superconductors that we could use in our particle detectors for a lot of different reasons. Supplying the power to them, uh, making new electronics chips based on uh, high temperature superconductors could be uh, a great energy savings. We wouldn't have to worry so much m about cooling the way we do and take up so much of the t detector volume with mm -hmm. cooling. Uh, so they're, they're, that would be fantastic if we had uh, superconductors that could be used in, in this context, for sure. But we don't. But we don't yet. <laughs> We're waiting. Um, you know, it, it, I believe, I personally believe that it will come in, in, the, in the coming years. They're getting higher and higher in terms of the temperature at which certain materials become superconducting, but then you need a, a, a material to be malleable, make it into wire. Yeah, that's, that's the problem, right? We have high temperature superconductors. And imagining, you know, superconducting computer chips, that's just, you know, yeah. quite science fiction yeah. right now, but yeah. I, I think it could happen. Okay, let's, let's, see, let's see if we, if we have anything else. Uh, ah, ba Bath Simpson, what are leptons, okay. of all things? So... I think most people know the structure of an atom has uh, a nucleus with protons and neutrons, and then there's a cloud of electrons. We discovered years ago that there are heavier versions, more massive versions of electrons called muons. And then in the 1970s, we learned that there's an even heavier version called the tau, my favorite particle, if you want to ask about that. <laughs> and those are the lepton, those are the charged leptons, and, and they have uh, partners called neutrinos, which are these ghostly particles that can pass through, t you know, light years of material without interacting. Yeah. So those are the leptons. Inside the protons and neutrons are particles called quarks. And quarks uh, make up the protons and, and neutrons, and they're held together. Everything's held together by what we call the strong nuclear force. Leptons don't feel that strong nuclear force. Uh, they, they interact with... Uh, Photons and uh, elect they are, have electromagnetic interactions, and also what we call the weak interaction, which I referred to before. Yeah. But leptons are are, are uh, a separate kind of particle from the particles that make up protons and neutrons. 
Yeah, so it's basically a class, a class of particles li li like like you just discuss yeah. dis uh, discuss their, their their properties. So it's a subset of of, of 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 all particles. Right. Okay. So I think it's time for us. Uh, uh, I know there's a, there's actually there's one more question. Sorry, okay. I thought I thought it's the end, but it's not. There's one more question, uh, but I don't see it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have to wait wait a second for the question to 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 navigate its way down to the CMS cavern. Uh, let's give it a moment. Yeah, it's it's the not electrons yet there. are a little slow today. I guess maybe electrons maybe electrons are a little slow. Ah, no, it's there. Karol Wojcicki. What happens? Ah, yeah. So what happens with the particles produced in the collision, I presume, after the collision? Are they absorbed by the surroundings or is there special materials that just sort of... That's exactly why we're 100 meters underground. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed, the particles that come flying out of these collisions, uh, a lot of it ends up in the rock surrounding this, this cavern that we're in. Mm -hmm. Uh, many of them decay on their way to the cavern, to other, other kinds of particles. But they, they eventually decay down to the lightest things that they can and um, are absorbed by the, the Earth. If we did this experiment on the surface, the uh, detector itself would be basically a radioactive hotspot that you wouldn't want to go anywhere near. And we don't, no one is in this cavern when the protons are colliding. The radiation inside here is just too intense yeah yeah but we don't have any sort of system to to, to keep them right we just they're, they're just sort of they're left uh, no, hitting the walls gone. and that's it that's fine that's it we don't need anything go, special bye bye all right so we'll be we'll be ra wrapping it up uh i know i have i think i have a special guest uh, here today uh hello chetna you're here to tell us about instagram live so do you still have some more questions and you don't want us to go then join us on Son's Instagram and ask us as many questions as you want. See you there. All right, so we'll, we'll be wrapping up this live, but we'll be back live on Instagram. So thank you to, thanks to you for, for joining us. Thanks to guests, our guests. Thanks to John for joining us today. Thanks to Leah for joining us uh, last Friday. Thanks, Chetna, for passing by. Thanks to the whole team that operated this live. And we'll see you soon. Stay safe. Bye. <laughs>